talk I'm going to give today is modified somewhat from a series of talks that I gave about two years ago in Tanzania, where uh, the government there was trying to decide whether to allow field trials of GMO crops. And I was asked to try to present a, a balanced uh, presentation on benefits and risk of GMO crops. And they were looking particularly at BT maize and subsequently did decide to allow field trials of BT cotton. So I don't know whether the, the talks that I gave had any impact or not, but uh, <clears throat> I think they uh, realized that the cotton industry in Tanzania had really disappeared because of the cotton budworm and that BT cotton could in fact allow uh, them to, to go back into production of a cash crop. So some of this is review and a little bit redundant, but not too much. <clears throat> and I feel like it's uh, the parts that are review will be a pretty good summary for some of the points I've been trying to make all through the semester. So we'll talk historically. I feel quite strongly that sort of the, the key feature of plant breeding is the germplasm. And in every crop, there's sort of a, a mainstream of germplasm that certainly is selected into lots of diverse types of varieties. But basically, the crop germplasm is what's almost sacred. You must continuously advance the gains from year to year, from generation to generation in that crop germplasm. And even though environments and, and management practices change, and, and even though we narrow the diversity of that germplasm quite severely, we have lots of opportunities to recreate variation through traditional crosses and other means. And so I sort of view it as starting with crop domestication. We really started the initial gene pools. Conventional plant breeding selects and improves those gene pools for the benefit of mankind. And molecular plant breeding, in my mind, is, is not a new concept. It's new technology to use molecular tools to continue to improve the crop germplasm. And I gave a seminar last Wednesday, was reminding, reminded that uh, my world is centered on plant breeders and other disciplines don't seem to be important. Other disciplines are very important. But the fact is, the world is centered on improvement of elite streams of germplasm. And if you're a plant breeder or a pathologist or an entomologist or an agronomist or a soil scientist, and you contribute towards the advancement of germplasm for increasing productivity and increase, increasing quality of food and therefore quality of life, then, then that's what I'm talking about as plant breeding. And again, you've seen this before, so I won't go over it. Just a couple of points. Humans have always guided the evolution of crops. I mean, natural evolution would not have given us any crops. Humans uh, developed crops. They started with a small sample of wild plants. There's been over 10,000 years of selection, and all the crops we grow today were once wild plants, but there are no crops that we grow today that would survive without human selection. And of course, the crops, the strains, and the genes have moved all around the globe and are still moving around the globe. Conventional plant, plant breeding is based on that pipeline of elite genetics. Plant breeders develop varieties that meet farmer and other customer needs. And conventional plant breeding over the years has adopted lots of technologies. Mutation breeding was a hot topic in the 60s and 70s. The age of computerization in the 80s, particularly the late 70s and 80s came in where plant breeders went heavily into computerized data analysis. GIS and GPS technology starting in the 80s and into the 90s adapted quite strongly, particularly by the plant breeding industry. Plant tissue culture applications have been adapted for over 70 years now. And so molecular technologies in terms of gene manipulation are also 
technologies that will be adapted and incorporated into conventional plant breeding. We just talked about tissue culture, two main applications, selection of superior plants, and production of large quantities of superior plants, and use of tissue culture to expand the plant gene pools. All right, since I gave this talk originally to audiences that range from all politicians to all scientists to all press people, uh, some very basic definitions. Plant molecular genetic or applications can either include molecular markers and genomics or plant transformations. In a lot of the world, when we talk about biotechnology or molecular technologies, Today, that's automatically equated with GMOs. And so it's very important that we realize that there are molecular technologies employed with markers and genomics that really don't transfer genes from distantly related organisms into plants. Whereas plant transformations, for the most part, produce what we define as GMOs. Markers and genomics can be used in a lot of ways, marker-assisted backcrossing, integrating genes from wild germplasm, quantitative trait loci, gene pyramiding, uh, study of transgressive segregants, construction of high-densely saturated maps of our major crops, comparative mapping in different plant species, <clears throat> DNA fingerprinting of crop varieties and collections, used extensively in combination with what we'll talk about on Wednesday, intellectual property protection of, of plant species, and then map-based cloning of genes. Just a review, as of actually the time I've done this, rice genome was completely sequenced. I don't think any of these others are completely finished yet, but we're close on several other species but Arabidopsis and rice have been completely sequenced as well as the human genome has been completely sequenced. All right, plant transformations to produce GMOs. <clears throat> we say that a transgenic event is a successful transformation of a plant cell with a gene of interest. And the events differ in the type of genetic component incorporated and the site at which the foreign DNA incorporates into the host genome. Because of <clears throat> the differences of, of a slightly different constructs in each of our genes to be incorporated and very little control that we have on the place where those genes insert, then each of these plants must be evaluated after they've been transformed. A GMO crop is any crop that's had a gene or genes inserted or modified by modern biotechnology techniques is called a genetic modified organism. I hope you understand by now that all of the crops that we deal with are genetically modified organisms. They have been modified through recombination and selection. They've been modified through mutation breeding. They've been modified by wide crosses with or without tissue culture. So all varieties that are developed and released today are genetically modified. But in popular terminology, GMOs are only those varieties in which gene or genes have been inserted using molecular technologies. So any food and products derived from GMOs are termed GM foods or GM food products. Now, often, when we think about GMO crops, we think of examples like the BT gene and maize or cotton as a wide transfer where genes from organisms or other kingdoms, such as bacteria, are inserted into plants. However, many cases of GMOs really involve close transfer, where genes are transferred from one species of plants to another. And a lot of GMOs really don't involve the transfer of any foreign DNA material at all. It involves tweaking of genes. 
turning genes off or on by knocking out control factors or, or using control factors that will activate certain gene actions. And really, a lot of the resistance or the fear of GMOs originally stemmed from this concept of taking genes out of bacteria, putting them into plants. I mean, for most of the lay population, that's, that's a really frightening concept. It, it sounds a lot more drastic and a lot more severe than being able to cross a maize plant with a wild relative, or even being able to take genes out of a maize plant and incorporate them into rice to produce the second generation golden rices. So this transfer of genes from bacteria into the plants or the foods that we eat or feed the animals was really what uh, concerned people. Well, have the concerns stopped the development and spread of GMO crops? No. The spread of genetically modified crops has, we will know in a few years, it's either been the fastest adoption of a new technology from plant sciences or the second fastest, depending on whether or not particularly this line in developing countries continues to increase. The other application that, that really was one of the fastest applications of uh, adaptation rates was hybrid maize in the U.S., where the use of hybrids went up fairly rapidly over about a 30, 40 year period. But as you can see, this is the top biotech countries. This is the total, the green line going up. The industrial or developed countries, the developing countries, and I'll show you those top biotech countries in another way. Uh, the countries here highlighted in the greenish background are countries that, as of 2006, have grown more than 50,000 hectares of biotech crops. And so, no surprising that number one is the U.S., number two is Argentina, uh, number three is Brazil. Argentina and Brazil both due to uh, Roundup Ready soybeans primarily. But uh, you look down here, number nine, Uruguay, seven, Paraguay, eight, South Africa, 11, Australia, 10, the Philippines, number five, India, number six, China, which as of 2006, China may have been in number six position, but they will soon move up to number one, two, or three. Romania in 12th position. Spain, a member of the European Union, in 14th and Mexico 13th. So a number of countries have adopted GMO technologies. There aren't any African countries on the list. And, and uh, lots of reasons for that. Reasons more focused on political motivation than on technical or, or on environmental or safety motivations. What are the crops? Well, insect resistant cotton, a BT gene inserted into cotton. Insect resistant corn, a BT gene inserted into corn. Herbicide resistant crops, primarily Roundup Ready, although several other herbicide tolerant crops are available, but soybean, canola, some use in corn. It may be coming in these other crops, but it's still yet to be produced. And then virus resistance with the, the ring spot resistant papaya being the most extensively used. Why were these crops adopted? Increased grain and fiber yield. And yes, they do give increased yields. Decreased operating costs, yes. They all give decreased operating costs. Enhance water conservation. Reduce soil erosion. Decrease pesticide spraying. But the real reason why farmers rapidly adopted these crops, the return 
per hectare to the farmer for growing herbicide tolerant soybeans is $30 a hectare. For growing herbicide tolerant canola, $39 a hectare. For growing BT corn, $67 per hectare. For growing BT cotton, $133 per hectare. Uh, you, can, you can make very emotional pleas that there are inherent dangers in these crops, particularly BT cotton. But BT cotton in India really spread through India like a wildfire. And subsequently, the government had to move to approve the, the regulation of BT cotton. BT cotton in China has been developed and is spreading through China. We point out some of the advantage, I think I have, oh, well, just to show some data from Peggy Lemieux at uh, UC Davis. In the U.S. today, corn occupies about 46% of the acres, canola, GE canola, 75%, soybeans, 82%, and cotton, 76%. So GMOs in the U.S. occupy very high percentage of acres. In corn, 46%. We knew historically that west of the Mississippi River, corn production was often subject to severe infestations of European corn borer, whereas in the eastern corn belt, there was less of a problem. If you move out to Nebraska, Colorado, western Iowa, you'll find 70 or 80 percent of the acres are BT. You come into Indiana, Ohio, and you'll find almost no BT corn. So about half of our corn belt is severely affected by European corn borers, 46% of the acres. Now this data from Peggy is as of 2004. Recently in 2005 release and 2006 initial sales, uh, Monsanto and others have come up with what they call a triple stack combination that's got BT for corn borer as well as BT for corn rootworm as well as Roundup Ready herbicide tolerance, that triple stack combination is selling out. The companies can't produce enough seed of it to meet demand, and in 2007 that will go to quite a high proportion. It'll go to as high a percentage of the corn acres as there is seed available to plant. The reason for that, though only half of our corn crop had much damage and even bothered to control European corn borers. All of the corn acres planted, just about, were treated chemically to control corn rootworm. Ironically, in corn, the corn farmer really doesn't care that much about Roundup Ready. Monsanto likes to have it in the mix. But the corn farmer in the U.S. who used to rotate corn and soybeans is thinking with all those Roundup Ready soybeans, the last thing I want is Roundup Ready corn coming in as volunteers in my soybean field because then Roundup won't control the corn in my soybean. Uh, because of the extensive use of corn for ethanol and biofuels and because of a soybean rust problem that has occurred, we're now seeing the U.S. Corn Belt going primarily to corn after corn after corn and the soybeans moving to Brazil and Argentina. So the percentage of this triple stack uh, trait may go quite high in U.S. corn. There are a couple of others, the GE papaya, 46% of the total crop, that's all Hawaii in the U.S., this is U.S. figures, and the GE squash, 19% of our total crop. So why, or what are the benefits of the biotechnology to farmers? increase productivity, efficiency, and profits if the traits work. And the ones we've talked about give increased productivity, efficiency, and profits. They provide resistance to diseases and pests, primarily pests so far. They provide a reduction in pesticide usage which reduces cost, environmental pollution, and health risk and they increase opportunities for using reduced or minimum tillage which prevents soil erosion and saves a lot of gasoline and energy in terms of uh, machinery for tillage. All right, I was going to make this point a few minutes ago. This is the U.S. 
the reduction in insecticide applications to manage European corn be breeder, borers. This is conventional corn. This is BT corn. So you can see a, a reduction from about, uh, what is this, weighted average applied, well, so whatever the 2.2 is, down to uh, less than half the amount being utilized. In China, the adoption of BT cotton has reduced farm deaths from chemicals by 85%. And so the Chinese farmers see an immediate benefit. The Chinese government is now bragging about the fact that we're really out there on the human rights forefront. We're saving these poor farmers from handling these toxic uh, insecticides. A lot of the reason for that, in India, the, the reduction in uh, death rates is a little bit lower but still significant. In China, the farmers just didn't use the proper clothing or precautions or, or equipment to apply. They were out spreading very, very toxic insecticides by hand with very little protection. And so the BT cotton has reduced death rates significantly. All right, what are concerns about GM crops? Primarily three types, food safety concerns. We can produce toxins, and you can develop a product that comes from a bacteria into a plant. It could be toxic. Uh, you could produce new allergens. And, and so even if you don't kill a lot of people, you can make them very sick. You can change the nutritional content. And initially, the biggest concern on safety was antibiotic resistance due to what? Not due to the BT gene, but due to the canamycin resistant selectable marker that was used to select the BT resistant cells in tissue culture. So as the new constructs of GM crops have been developed, I think we've gone probably 100% away from antibiotic resistance as selectable markers. Environmental issues, harmful effect on beneficial organisms, herbicide-resistant weeds, genetic pollution. All of these potentially significant impacts, ethical and social issues, probably the major resistance to GMO crops, particularly in Europe, arose from the fact that people were afraid that it would lead to control of agricultural production by big corporations. And quite specifically, the Europeans were afraid that it would lead to control of agricultural production by big U.S. corporations because Monsanto was the first and major proponent of GM crops in Europe. The Europeans have been uh, much less sensitive to GM products produced by European companies. And in fact, the Europeans are quite accepting of using the same technology to modify yeast and, and various components that they utilize to produce cheese and wine. So the technology was not a concern for the Europeans, uh, but the fact that uh, the first products to be developed were Roundup Ready soybean and BT corn, and who's going to benefit from that? Well the European farmer, and U.S. corporations. So let's look at safety. Uh, biotech products must go through the following approach. First, information must be gathered on safety of the gene and protein. They look at sources of the gene, the characterization of the gene, the insert place and, and uh, size, copy number, the integrity of the gene. For any proteins that the gene produces, they look at the history of safe use and consumption, the function, specificity, and mode of action, the levels of proteins produced, 
and any toxicology or allergenicity that the proteins might create. On the other side, for looking at the crop, they look at approximate analysis as basically the composition of the food or the feed not changed from the standard crop. They look at the key nutrients, anti-nutrients, animal performance test, environmental studies, they look at safety to non-target organisms, effects on soil degradation, degree of outcrossing, and susceptibility to any diseases. Very extensive testing required in order for regulatory approval of these crops. In fact, the industry itself, when it developed these crops, goes through three phases of safety assessment. In the discovery phase, when you're looking at developing a product concept of gene discovery, you consider the safety of genes. There was a lot of, of publicity about a gene that uh, Pioneer had developed and was going to put in soybeans that they got out of Brazil nut that would cause allergens. Well, that was eliminated, eliminated very early in DuPont and Pioneer's assessment of the gene because as soon as they found out the allergenic potential, they said, that's not a product, let's toss it. Uh, the source of the genes, history of the safe use, the ethics of using the genes, the environmental ecological considerations. In phase two, when you go through greenhouse and field evaluation, which is a key step in the evaluation of any variety in a private breeding and development program, you look at the biological and agronomic equivalents. Does basically, do you get the same agronomic performance and efficacy of the gene over in, in different environments, over years, over locations? And in this phase, more than 99% of all potential transgenic events are tossed. Finally, when you get into variety development and field production, they have to do detailed product safety for food, for feed, and for environmental effects. Of the of the ethics of using the gene. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, the ethics relate to, to uh, whether you really have access, legal access, to acquiring and utilizing that gene. But uh, in terms of ethics, a lot of people were really upset when people talked about the Terminator gene. And basically, the Terminator gene would be added to crops, and the farmer could grow the seed he bought from the seed company, but the Terminator gene would not let that seed produce the next generation. And, and so there was a big concern about, is that ethical? That you can force the farmer to come back and buy seed from you, whether he thinks it's to his economic advantage or not? Well, again, the Terminator gene doesn't work. It worked in a few selected species and a few environments and was really discarded. I mean, in fact, no one in the seed industry actually picked up the Terminator gene. Delta Pineland looked at it in terms of studying the U.S. Department of Agriculture data, and their final decision was, no, it's too risky. It's not going to work. But those are the types of, of ethical considerations that, that uh, concern people. Um, so this is the process that a GMO product has to go through before it's released. What do we do for conventionally bred materials or materials from wide crosses or materials developed through mutational breeding? What sort of safety assessment do we do? We don't have any. For all other types of varieties we develop, safety is determined based on knowledge of the previous history of use. So if you've been growing potatoes for years and potatoes have been good for you and you bring in some exotic component through a wide cross or through mutations, you don't do any testing of the safety of that product. You have a limited introduction of the new variety because the way new varieties work, you start with breeder seed 
and you produce first generation a limited amount of seed to go out for farmer producers. And if there are no detrimental effects seen from people eating that limited introduction, then we gradually enlarge it for new food usage. There have been numerous examples of feed, uh, of food stuffs developed through traditional breeding and through mutations breeding that have in fact created toxic and allergenic effects. So do we need to test all new varieties we develop through stringent regulatory tests for safety and, and uh, environmental uh, effects? Wow, if, if we do, our price of release of new varieties is going to go up astronomically. I mean, it's going to be significant increase in cost of seed to farmers and cost of food. Yeah. What is the? Do you have an example? Is it there are numerous crops? Well, probably the the, the uh, worst example I'm familiar with is uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture at Penn State University developed a new potato variety that had higher glycoalkaloid contents and gave excellent resistance to potato late blight disease. Developed, released that variety in Pennsylvania. In the Amish communities in Pennsylvania, about three years later, there was a noticeable rise in infants born with spinal bifida. And ultimately, they traced back the fact that the higher glycoalkaloids in those potatoes consumed by pregnant women resulted in infants being born with spinal bifida. Uh, so other examples I'll have to draw in a blank now, but I can pull up a, a list numerous examples of, of materials developed. Uh, well, I mean, not just with, with uh, in all new foodstuffs. If um, there, there's a database for USDA does what they call a grass, gradually, gradually recognized as safe materials. And it's G-R-A-S acronym. And if you go look through the G-R-A-S acronym, a lot of these types of conventionally developed products were detected but not before the release, after the release because any change in, in the, the food value, anything fed to humans that has a significant change must go through grass screening and regulations. But that's the best we do. Alright, so are there food safety concerns? Yeah, certainly. Every time you take a new gene, a gene that you take out of a bacteria and you reconstruct it to make it look like a plant gene and you put it into a, a crop plant and you're not sure where it inserts or how it's actually replicated and read and, and functions through that deal, sure there's a risk. Is there a risk with these GM crops that have gone through this regulatory process? and uh, we're eating today? Well, the food safety has been extensively investigated for the release crops, and the consistency is that GM foods pose no greater health risk than conventionally developed foods. I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me because the conventionally developed foods have not gone through any extensive investigations of their health risk, whereas the GM crops have. All GM crops used as foods or food ingredients are required to undergo this thorough, rigorous assessment. And to date, more than one billion cumulative hectares of GM crops have been grown over the past decade with no documented adverse effects on humans or animals. So my conclusion is, yeah, there's always the potential danger of the next new GM crop developed might have a problem. But as long as we're incurring all of the expense and the time to do this very rigorous safety evaluation, wow, I would rather eat the stuff that's really been tested by experts who tell me that it's safe than to eat new conventionally developed foods that nobody's ever tested. Yeah. What about uh, genetically modified plants that are not used for food consumption? <laughs> 
in some cases, I mean, if, you know, India sort of skirted the issue with GM cotton because they said, okay, GM cotton's a fiber crop, so we don't have to go through all of the food safety issues. Well, that's true to the extent that cotton oil is used for cooking and feed in India, and cotton meal for feed. But in the U.S., uh, cotton had to go through testing because we use cotton oil, and, and cotton is both a food and a fiber crop. But yeah, a crop that's only used for fiber production and nothing, you know, no animal or, or human eats it, why is there a worry about its safety for food consumption? I mean, a lot of the natural crops we grow for fibers you don't eat. I mean, you just can't eat a lot of the stuff we use for fibers today. All right, let's look at environmental concerns. A lot of concerns over the BT genes. Uh, they have, the, the first concerns were the BT genes aren't worth it. Some reports came out saying that the BT varieties didn't yield as well as the conventional. Well, a lot of that was due to this yield lag effect. People didn't have the BTs in the right elite genetics, particularly in some of the early generations of BT cotton in India because small companies picked these up, drug them over the border from China, introduced them and released them without extensive yield testing. They had to go through regulatory trials in India for variety registration, but not for uh, GM crops. So basically they have resulted, increased yields and earnings, they have provided very effective control of the target pest. They have reduced the amounts of pesticides used on cotton and maize, and in fact, in BT areas, there's an increased diversity of native insects populations versus non-BT crops. Why would you expect that? Less chemicals sprayed. The chemicals are not selective. They kill a lot of non-target insects as well as your pest. What about glyphosate-tolerant genes? They provide more effective weed control, especially in soybeans. There was not a good, cheap, effective herbicide available for soybeans. And Roundup Ready soybeans solved that problem. They provide flexibility and timing of applications. You don't have to broadcast your herbicide before you plant in order to kill the weeds. You wait to see what weeds come up, then you spray across the crop because the crop's resistant to the Roundup. They reduce the need for conventional tillage, saving labor, saving fuel, and saving soil, uh, or conserving our, our soils. They actually resulted in lower amounts of herbicides applied. It turned out that even on Roundup Ready soybeans, that farmers can get by with reducing the amount of Roundup by 30%. Nothing that Monsanto really would like to have seen happen, but it has. And glyphosate or Roundup is a very safe, environmentally compatible or friendly herbicide. A guy that I hired from Monsanto to work for me at Cargill said, basically for glyphosate, you can mix it in your bathtub from very, very cheap ingredients and if you wanted to, you could take a bath in it and drink a few, that its LD50 is just a little bit lower than that of tap water. And so very, very safe to systems that don't contain, contain chlorophyll. It's not persistent in the soil. In fact, one of its major disadvantages is Roundup will kill the weeds that are growing, but it doesn't have a lasting effect in the soil. So it's a really a very, very safe. So it, it, it just it boggles my mind that environmental groups who are fighting for safer, more environmentally friendly herbicides didn't jump on the bandwagon for Roundup Ready crops just because they were developed using GMO technology. I mean, saying that just doesn't make sense. 
the environmental groups should have been major supporters of a move to a cleaner, greener herbicide, and yet they weren't. Concerns about these secondary effects. Well, there's no data to date to indicate that herbicide resistant GM crops will be super weeds. In fact, if, if you ever take a course in weed science or plant physiology and, and you look at all of the attributes that weeds have to make them invasive, adding a Roundup resistant gene to a canola plant is not going to make it a weed. In, in, in fact, even in canola fields where you want to get rid of it and it's Roundup resistant, you can spray it with another herbicide and knock it out easily. Uh, GM crops don't reduce the genetic diversity of our germplasm, elite germplasm pool, any more than conventional crops do. I mean, yeah, there's been a reduction in diversity by a lot of new varieties going to BT genes, but boy, we've reduced the diversity tremendously in most of our improved crop varieties anyway. Horizontal gene flow may occur from a cross-pollinated GM crop. Yeah, it's going to occur, just as it does from a cross-pollinated conventional crop. I mean, and GM crops could result in development of new pest resistance. Yeah, it could happen if you're dealing with a highly specific, specialized insect pest. The concern that's going to happen with a generalist feeder like European corn borer, again, the possibilities there are very, very low. Oops. All right, so what are the arguments in favor of using GM crops in developing countries? They improve productivity. That comes from lower production cost and increased yields. What is our major need in developing countries today? Increased productivity, more food. Herbicide tolerant and insect resistant crops lower chemical use in agricultural production. And the herbicide tolerant crops could lower the labor needed to weed. Reductions in use of ag chemicals will have favorable effects on human health and the environment. GM crops are expected to have positive effects on food safety because of less chemicals to run off into the water supplies. Herbicide tolerant crops re reduce needs for tillage, prevent soil erosion, they reduce labor requirements, and the new generation of GM crops are expected to come online that will improve productivity by increasing abiotic stresses. So a lot of arguments in favor of using GM crops in developing countries. What are arguments against? They have additional cost for the seed and for the traits. And uh, the costs are sometimes significant. And unless those costs are returned to the farmer in terms of increased profits, then the farmer is going to make that decision and say, well, that's a GM crop I'm not going to use. It makes little sense to make that extra payment for seed and for the trait if I'm not getting any returns. They may present future unseen risk to the environment and to the economics of food production. Yeah, I think every new variety that we develop could have future unseen risk. The GM crops, because genes are coming from different unrelated kingdoms, may pose greater risk. They may present risk to human health that are not apparent yet. Th this argument is losing strength because four or five years ago people were saying, well, we've only had GM crops out there for two or three or four years, and we haven't had much experience with long-term feeding of those crops. Well, since 1996 now, we've had 11 years of experience in feeding and eating GM crops. And still, we don't have any long-term risk appear yet. They may crossbreed with wild relatives of crops, and that could have some negative impact. Pesticide-resistant crops may have an adverse effect on non-target insect species. Yeah, the BT gene may kill some non-target insects. 
Use of GM crops may restrict assets to European markets. Of all the ones on the list, this is the major disadvantage of GM crops for developing countries. If your country is exporting that crop to the European Union, until just recently now, the European Union has shifted to a point where they've released some of their bans on GM crops. But until just recently, if your country was developing a crop that was exported to European Union, then you might as well stay away from GM crops because the European Union would blackball your country. And in Tanzania, you know, it was sort of an interesting dilemma because they used to export cotton to the European Union, but insects had become so bad that they couldn't control them with chemicals, so they lost that cotton business. Their decision was, do we let BT maize come in? And the first question I asked their minister, I says, well, how much maize do you export to the European Union? Huh. Well, why would you worry about growing BT maize? if you're not going to export it to the European Union. You may want to worry about BT cotton. And as I said earlier, subsequently, they approved the testing of BT cotton. So I think their feeling was, because maybe cotton is a fiber crop, it might be more acceptable to, to European imports. So what's needed on GM crops? Objective assessment of both the benefits and the risk. The proponents and the opponents must have the goal of the responsible use of technology. There are a number of opponents of GM crops that are not opponents of GM crops per se. They're opponents of new technology. And I, I've debated with some of these people, and I find it ironic that while I'm standing and talking to them about this topic, they interrupt to answer their cell phone. And I said, you know, cell phones really new technology, and we don't yet know the long-term effects of holding that phone up to your ear for several hours a day. You may be frying your brain. So if you're against technology, how can you adopt cell phones and microwave ovens and other newer technologies and be against GM technologies? You should acknowledge both the benefits and the risk so that the public understands potential risk and the potential benefits and can really make their own choices or decisions. The evaluation should be based on existing scientific principles. A, a lot of studies that are not scientifically validated that tend to support data one direction or the other are not very useful. Both proponents and opponents should refrain from exaggeration and sensationalism. And three years ago, there was an extensive amount of sensationalism on both sides. And when considering human health and food safety concerns, it's necessary to conduct rigorous scientific assessments to ensure the safety of each new product. So, yeah, I don't think the products we have out there today pose any potential risk, or at least I think the potential of risk is so low and the benefits are so high that we're foolish not to accept and utilize the crops. Every new crop developed from the technology, yeah, we must test it. So the point is the technology itself is not dangerous. The technology is just a newer, quicker, faster, maybe a little more efficient way to identify and move traits into our crop varieties. The nature of the traits that we select and put into the crop varieties and the response of those genes to the rest of that genome are the things we need to evaluate. And that's got to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. So in summary, humans have used genetic engineering to improve the food supply for centuries. 
Molecular technologies is not in itself, does not in itself create any additional risk. The function, efficacy, and side effects of the genes being transferred need to be evaluated, and the safety and environmental evaluation should be on a case-by-case -case basis. Questions about GMOs? Yeah. Genetic pollution. What is genetic pollution? I mean, I'm a plant breeder. I'm in the business of creating, I guess, genetic pollution. If you're talking about bringing new genes into my crop species, uh, is pollution bringing undesirable genes? If that's the case, then I'd better stop making any crosses because most crosses with while relatives bring in more undesirable genes than desirable. So I, you know, I, I know what you're saying, but I mean, what is genetic pollution? I mean, if the BT gene gets into endogenous land races of maize in Mexico, is that genetic pollution? What does it harm? Does it change those land races significantly? Will it persist in those land races? without somebody coming to select to see whether, I mean, do you think that the corn borer populations in Mexico, where European corn borer doesn't even exist, you think that that will select for only BT endogenous race corn? I mean, what? I, I just, I don't understand the concept of genetic pollution. Um, and or at least I can understand, you can say, genetic pollution is taking a desirable gene pool and polluting it with undesirable genes. Okay, well, if you do that, then it seems foolish to do it. But if you do it, that doesn't affect your ability to select back out of that gene pool and keep right on going. So I, I don't, that, that concept worries me a little bit. The worries I have on a lot of these concerns is the concerns are often expressed, I think, by botanists. And the big concern I have is, botanists should at least have to take a course in genetics. I mean, we can't do plant breeding without knowing basic botany on flower structure and pollination systems and, and basic uh, fertility regulation mechanisms. So how can you get through a degree in botany without having a course in genetics and understanding some of these concepts? Um, but yeah. Haven't there been seen increased use in Roundup because of Roundup persistent weeds? Is what? Increased use in pesticides, um, pesticide herbicides. Yeah. Roundup because of resistance to Roundup? Um, there has been resistance to Roundup around for 15 or 20 years. There are a number of weeds that have developed resistance to Roundup. But increased use in the Roundup breeding. Soybeans, there's that potential. So far, the, the number of acres going into Roundup ready soybean production are going up linearly, if not exponentially, each year. And, and so there's been no concerns expressed from Brazil and Argentina who use almost 100% Roundup ready soybean production that they're seeing increase in weeds. But sure, that's that's will happen. Um, but again, it's it's a matter if if that happens, then farmers will find out. Well, if there's a weed that's severe enough in soybean fields that becomes Roundup resistant, then farmers will have to worry about: Do I add an additional herbicide on top of my Roundup ready crop, or do I switch to a new insect or herbicide resistant crop, or whatever? But the reason U.S. Corn Belt farmers were not very anxious about Roundup Ready corn is for that reason. I mean, wait a minute. One of our worries would be that corn would develop Roundup tolerance and become a weed in our soybean fields. Now, you want me to buy and plant Roundup tolerant corn? Because you know if you plant corn and in soybeans next year, corn volunteers will come back up in that soybean field. I mean, we know that. So, but now with this three, a stack of three, farmers are, are going more and more.
to round up ready corn, which my assumption is they're doing less and less soybeans. There are so far three additional herbicide tolerant genes out there. Um, and in fact, one was developed just from mutation selection and doesn't have to go through regulatory controls. So right now, at least three of our students at ACCI are trying to incorporate that herbicide resistance into sorghum, millet, and maize so that they can use a seed treatment, a seed pellet coating that contains that herbicide so it'll control striga or witchweed. So there are several projects underway now to, to utilize herbicide tolerance in a crop to control a witchweed or a striga, which is a very, very severe pest. And uh, of course, all of them have gone with, with uh, the, the non-GMO form of herbicide tolerance so that they don't have to go through any GMO regulatory testing.